How are you all? Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, like we said, we will be getting to some audience questions in just a bit. But I'd love to kick things off. We're in the city of Chicago. Do you have any good memories of this place? Like, what, what are some of the times that you've spent in Chicago um, here? And are you doing anything this weekend specifically while you're here? Oh, this is what I'm doing this weekend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I have intimate knowledge of the table that I've been sitting at for yeah. about eight hours. Um, I have great memories of Chicago. Uh, the first time I, I spent time in this city, uh, we, were, we were starting a film called Flatliners. Mm. And uh, thank you. And uh, it was my it was my second film with Joel Schumacher, the first being Lost Boys, and uh, and I remember uh, Joel Schumacher as a director uh, had such an, a unique visual style, uh, and I remember it was quite cold out. Uh, it was at the end of autumn, kind of very beginning of winter, and Kevin Bacon was noticing that everywhere we went there were these kind of open fires. Uh, wherever we were shooting it, oh and gosh. Joel was using that as a light source. <laughs> and, and, and Kevin finally leaned into me and said, I don't think this is a medical drama at all. I think this is a secret film about the Great Chicago Fire. Oh my and, God. <laughs> and I remember that's when I realized, and this was like within the first two days of working, and Kevin Bacon just had such a great, great sense of humor. And we, we had a blast making the film. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think, I think we got lucky that we shot half the film here in Chicago, and then we took the other half back to Los Angeles. Sure. Because uh, if we had tried to last the whole four months, we were having a little too much fun in the city. So <laughs> I, I think sending everybody home kind of helped out for us a bit. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, having a little too much fun, uh, meaning uh, kind of, you know, some late night uh, adventures. Well, this is just the, I mean, just do the math. The hours alone, I mean, Gibson's in the middle of the city didn't close till four. Uh, every bar in Los Angeles closed at 1.30 back then at the time. So, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we weren't prepared for the, the additional hours. <laughs> uh, I have to ask, uh, since you knew Chicago and you were young growing up in Chicago and hanging out, you must have tried the food. There are three specialty items that Chicago is known for. You get to pick one. Chicago-style hot dog. Deep dish pizza or Italian beef? What would be your go-to? Italian beef. No. Yeah. All right. All right. Not even, not even a hot, hot and sweet peppers. Just sweet. You like the marinara? What's what's your style? Me, I, I well, the or the gardenia. The Italian beef that I that I know doesn't really have a marinara. It's just kind of an au jus with exactly. the gravy. Exactly. Uh, and and if if I could just get. The, the meat and the au jus and the bread, I'd be done. <laughs> I think you can order that from most Italian beef yeah. places, just the bread. I forget what it's called. Just gravy, gravy bread, right? Gravy, gravy bread? Yeah, you can just get gravy bread. <laughs> That's a preference. Yeah, amazing. Uh, talk about those times, because I want to talk, again, not about specific uh, movies that you made, but about that crew. Uh, any Brat Pack fans out there in the crowd right now? What is it like to be a part of a cast again that, um, or a group of people, a group of actors, a group of artists that has a moniker, you know, and has been known um, for that? Well, I think, so, I think everybody got painted with that moniker that was working in the 80s and early 90s. Um, the article for, for the Brat Pack, the article was based on St. Elmo's Fire. Yes. Uh, and it included Rob Lowe, every, everybody that was in that movie. And, and it's really unfortunate. The, the article was done by a journalist from The New Yorker. Uh, Emilio Estevez had become friendly with him and, and led him into his life. And I think the journalist took deep advantage of that. <laughs> yeah. um, and he invited the journalist you know, because he was talking about these other actors that he was doing the film with, and he said, well, let's all go to lunch and you'll get to meet them, and it'll be cool. And so Emilio, I think, felt really bad that everybody got kind of painted by that swath when, in all fairness, you know, I got to do Young Guns with him. This is the nicest guy on the planet. Yeah. And <laughs> one, of the, one of the funniest guys uh, you'll ever meet. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I think it's certainly at the time, uh, I don't think anyone took it as a positive thing. Sure. Um, because we were working. We were working and we were working hard and we were trying to make really good films and I think we did. Um, you know, when I think of the films in the 80s and the 90s, I'm really proud of that work. Uh, so it, it doesn't make you feel good to have something trivialized. For sure. And to have yourself trivialized like that, especially by a journalist who had never risked anything, who had never put himself in front of an audience before, didn't know what that was like. So, 
clearly I sound like I've still got an issue with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it didn't really kind of, I had an issue with it because I saw it kind of hurt other people. For sure. Yeah, yeah. not being so, included. So yeah, and I just, yeah, you yeah. know, and it's just, I'm, I'm not much for clubs and labels and all of that stuff. Yeah, you know? I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have uh, a ton of fans uh, here that were fans of those big 80s and 90s uh, films. Am I right? Yeah. Thank you. Regardless, regardless of the name attached to it, uh, we thank you for and, and all those actors for for the amazing work you did back then. And we're all here today, so that leaves me. Um, you, you joked uh, earlier about being at the table all day, eight hours, you know, at a convention. But I'd love to just hear what it means to you uh, to have fans line up to just get some personal time to talk to you, to get your autograph, to get a photo with you. What it, what, what does it mean to you to be at these conventions? It, it, it means so much. And, yeah. and 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 just so you're aware, I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm I'm absolutely aware of the fact that we're, we're, we're selling a, a photograph with an autograph and, and this and that. But without the structure of this, there isn't another circumstance that I would ever find myself in that would allow me to meet as many people who are fans of either a specific film or the body of my work and other actors' work. Yes. The truth is, uh, and, and I say this kind of when I play music concerts a lot, and, and because that's the other kind of assembly that I have of people that are fans of other stuff. Um, I've been able to work as an actor professionally since I was 15 years old. Uh, it was a fantasy. It was the greatest gift uh, anyone could possibly receive. And now I have people that are coming to, to music shows and that are letting me play music in front of them and allowing me to do that. Uh, storytelling is a passion of mine. Uh, it, it, it crosses a lot of different genres of entertainment. Um, but I've had one of the most extraordinary lives anyone could ever imagine. And it's because of you. My life and everything I've been able to do has been because of you and the support that I've had from you. So to be able to at least come to a convention in the context and structure of this and simply say thank you, uh, you know, it doesn't even scratch the surface of the debt that I feel. Um, but you guys have given me the greatest life of all time, and I cannot <laughs> thank you enough. Yeah, let's hear it. Uh, so Come on. I love that. Thank you for that. Is there a memorable experience or maybe a unique gift or, or something that a fan has asked you to do, uh, do at a convention that, that sticks out in your mind as, as, a, as a fun occasion or maybe just a, a, an emotional occasion? Me, I, I, when I see people in the costumes, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I think that's just cool. I, it's just the level of commitment. You know, when I, <laughs> there, was, there was a gentleman yesterday, I'm not even sure what he was dressed as, but it was kind of <laughs> half elf. It, it was like if Elf met a superhero, met something else, <laughs> because he, he was clear, clearly going to more than one table, <laughs> and he packed it all in, and I just thought, you know, you're a badass. I, I, yeah, just, yeah. I think it's so cool that you can allow yourself to have that kind of fun. Yeah. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that part of it. And again, it's, it's not a specific person or, you know, every once in a while something will stand out. For sure. But I just, the generosity that I've experienced uh, by the folks that come up to say hello uh, is moving and it's extraordinary. And, and it's, I think the one frustration that I certainly know that I feel and I have felt with other actors uh, when we've talked about it is that there doesn't seem to be enough time to have the kind of earnest moment that you really want to have with every single person. For sure. Uh, but I think everybody's doing their best to kind of get through that and, and it, again it's required a great generosity on all of your part uh, but yeah it's, it's I, I I have not done a lot of these in, in my career mm -hmm. um, and I've always surprised about how moving I kind of find it yeah amazing amazing and, and doing this panel is super important to the fans as well so we thank you for being up here Thanks. on stage because you're hitting a lot of folks here in we're going to get to uh, their questions in a sec. You mentioned the funny cosplay. It sounds like either a, a cool mashup or maybe like a D&D character. Those always are fun to see yeah, yeah. because it's a, it's coming from an original creation, an original character from that. Um, is there anyone that <laughs> you were um, a young a young lad coming to a convention, who would you have cosplayed as uh, back as, as young Kiefer? Did you have any oh, big fandoms back in the day? I would have been Ace Freely from Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
And I think I did that for Halloween for like three years from the time <laughs> I was like 11 to 14. Um, yeah, that, that was, yeah, there was always kind of the, the costumes with rock and roll at yeah, that yeah. time. Uh, you know, between 78 and 85 were just all so exciting. So that kind of incorporated a lot of stuff for me. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, we know you're a musician as well. Uh, we, we have Gene, actually, Gene Simmons, uh, does does the convention circuit uh, pretty often. If you, like, want, had to wait in line, or if you just not had to, you decided to wait in line um, for a photo op or autograph, would it be rock stars? Would that be sort of the, the lines that you would trend towards? Or was there someone back in the day that you, like... No, it's, you know, I mean, I, I was so moved that Michael Fox has been here for the last yes. two days yeah, because yeah. that... Yeah. So Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and again, I've been so lucky with the people that i worked with. He's one of the nicest people in the world, too. And obviously is, is facing a huge physical and, and emotional challenge uh, with Parkinson's mm -hmm. and, and just the generosity that he's displayed in his lifetime uh, of, of what he's managed to raise and the advancements that he's made that will affect generations before him. Yes. Uh, sorry, after him. Right. Uh, and he, he himself will not reap the benefits of that. I mean, that that's a kind of pay it forward that you, you can't even imagine. So, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, every once in a while you get to, to see someone that uh, you kind of admire and, and you don't think you might get another chance to do that. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just, Stand in line for half the people that are here. This yeah, weekend. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, you mentioned getting started and having uh, the fortunate and lucky life to to get started at 15 and, and continue to work. Uh, you grew up in a Hollywood slash acting family. Obviously, the great Donald Sutherland and Shirley Douglas. What was what was that like? You know, how much influence did it have in your early acting career? Um, having that in your life. Well, I didn't grow up with my dad. Right. Uh, I didn't grow up with my dad at all. I, I grew up with my mom and my twin mm -hmm. sister, and my older brother left when I was seven. And um, you know, and I would see my dad once a year, or maybe once every two years. Um, I was certainly aware of his success as an actor, sure, because the adults talked about it. But it wasn't like he was making movies that I or my friends could go see. For sure. In fact, I have a younger brother who who got in trouble for lying, telling kids at school that his, his dad was Christopher Reeves who played Superman. <laughs> and uh, so our dad was making films for adults and, I, and it was something that, you know, by the time I was 18 and they had VHS movies and I remember apologizing to my dad for not knowing uh, specifically how diverse uh, and prolific an actor he was. And he said, well, how could you? You were a kid. Yeah. Um, so I was much more impacted by my mother's experience with the theater. Amazing. And for instance, I would go to school, my sister would go to school, we'd do whatever after school activities they wear, we'd get our homework and we'd go to the theater. And my mother would be getting ready for, for her performance that evening, we would do our homework, and then we would listen to kind of part of the play over the speakers backstage, my mother would finish her performance and we'd go home. Yeah. So we spent so much time with the you know the stage managers and the other actors and that they became a surrogate kind of family and they were just they were interesting they were they were extroverts they were you know they all had skills they could dance they could sing that it was much more vaudevillian uh experience that i had growing up compared to like emilio who grew up in malibu sure. kind of around filmmaking uh so so it was a very, it was a very different experience, and so when I finally did a film in Canada that got me to the United States, I felt like I was having a real fresh start. Like, uh, you know, it was just so silly, right? You're 15. How could it not be a fresh start? <laughs> but I, I felt like I was actually changing uh, direction in, in the kind of work as an actor that I was doing, and, and it felt very fresh to me. Uh, whereas someone like Emilio directed and wrote at a very early age because he'd been watching his dad make films yeah. his whole career. So it was, you know, it was very different ways to come at it. Yeah, well, we all love our moms, so it sounds yeah, like yours cheers, was the best, yeah. too. Yeah, cheers to the moms out there, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for answering my questions. Uh, I do want to get to our fans now. Again, uh, remember, due to the strike, uh, no specific mention of struck work, but we'll take uh, any uh, questions you'd like to start with. Tell us your first name and your question. Hi, my name is Adina. Um, I've been a huge fan of your work, honestly, since 
the 80s and 90s um, were some of the best work that you did. Um, one particular work that we're not going to mention. Um, the question that I have is because I'm an ethical person. I'm actually I'm an ICU nurse. I've been one for 10 years and I was on the front lines. And um, you portrayed a role that was uh, very conflicting with possible ethics that you may have had at the time. And it's one of your more powerful performances in the 90s. How were you able to kind of dedicate yourself to your work um, day in and day out, giving such a conventional performance while at the same time kind of um, maybe compartmentalizing so it doesn't conflict with your own personal beliefs and ethics to give such a dedicated performance? Like, you know, how are you able to just kind of like get into your work, get into your job, and even though things could maybe impact you at the time, yeah. you were able to just kind of give a performance that the person that you portray, that I think you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm um, doing very good. I think I've narrowed it down to two or three at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but is obviously not the person who you are or how you were raised. So how um, are you able to do that? Because as uh, in my role, in my position, in my career, Sometimes those ethics are continuously challenged myself. Right. So. No, it's. Um, I, I'm going to just take a stab at you know I, I played a couple characters over the course of my career that 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 were not good, <laughs> and 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 then there was one character specifically. Uh, well, there, there was a few that were really hard to do. But the storytelling is what really matters. And so if you break down the idea of a film and you kind of associate band members to it, right? So in one movie you might be the singer, but the next movie you're gonna be the bass player. Well, you still have to play that part properly and you have to fit into the band. You can't try and outshine the singer because it'll fall apart, it won't work. And so you have to be true to telling the story within the context of what that film is deciding to be. Um, I've done a number of films, whether it was Eye for an Eye, A Time to Kill, uh, Time to Kill specifically dealing with racism. If you're going to take on the character of someone in the Ku Klux Klan, then you have an obligation to show an audience, especially a younger audience, why racism is bad, why it's evil, and why it will destroy a community, a society, and, and so there's a great sense of responsibility when you take on that part and you have to lean into it. And you know people are gonna hate you for it. Uh, and, and I think that's a credit to the fact that we make movies that people really believe are real. They're not, but, but people do believe they're, they're real. After Eye for Eye and I opened, I took my daughter who was eight years old into Chuck E. Cheese and I've never seen parents leave a place so fast <laughs> with their children in my life. And my daughter actually thought I'd rented the place for just us because <laughs> within 10 minutes, everybody was gone. Um, I was mortified by that and she was just in the ball section playing by herself just having the time of her life. Um, as I said, I've got, I've got a daughter. You know, uh, there was a movie where I was, my character was a predator and he attacked women. Um, it was the hardest film I've ever, ever had to do. But again, if you're going to be responsible to telling the story and what was important about that story, that crime was getting out of control and specifically in Los Angeles and that the justice department, the court system and the police seemed unable to contain it. And it was a specific time uh, in that city's history that we were reflecting upon. And, and in order for that message to get across, that character had to be that evil. And so you, you use that as the rationalization and the justification for the things that you're going to do in the context of telling the story uh, and, 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 and hope that people will understand that, that it's a film and that you're trying to convey an idea and that's one part of it. But it's, it's, it's certainly challenging. <laughs> I, I remember I've, I've done a couple films where other actors have gone like, oh my God, why did you choose to do this? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I, I, thought it, I thought it'd be a challenge. And like, <laughs> well, surviving the next year is gonna be a challenge. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, okay. 
Amazing. Thank you I haven't much. done any of those for a while. If you've noticed, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Have, I have learned a little bit. Yeah. You turned the corner. You became a good guy. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you for thank that. You thank so you so much. Great question. Yeah, great question. Let's hear yeah. it for the moment. Come on. And obviously, we thank you uh, for all your work uh, with the organization Artists Against Racism. Obviously, it's an important thing yeah. for you, and we yeah. appreciate that. So, thank you. Well, it's, I mean, I've, I've had the great fortune of um, I used to rodeo professionally in the USTRC circuit, and, and and so I saw a lot of the country that I, I just would not normally have seen uh, all all through the Southwest, all the way up through Utah, um, and as and as and as far east as as Missouri. Um, and what I found so amazing about these rodeos, and there's always this kind of, this terrible misnomer that kind of in the rural areas it gets trickier uh, racially, and in the cities it's, it's whatever that is. And, right. and I just, my experience is that I just did not find that to be the case. Mm. Um, you know, when I was rodeoing, I, I, I was amazed uh, to see how active women were in the sport, um, and there was absolutely no issue with that. Uh, you, you had everybody from Native Americans to Hispanic Americans to Anglo Americans all rodeoing together, all spending time together. All, uh, if someone, you know, had a harness strap or a cinch strap on a saddle brake, you, before you could even ask for it, someone was handing you yeah. theirs, yeah. right? And so there was a real sense of community there, and I was really, I was moved and taken by that. And um, and I, I think we have to realize that the small angry voices that we're hearing out there that are, are, are making us feel like this, our world is coming apart and, and, and our values are being challenged. They're, they're, they're a small number of people using technology <laughs> as a very, very big microphone. Yeah. But I think we need to really keep faith in the fact that through my experience, uh, the American people are as generous as a group of people as I've ever seen. And, uh, and and my travels have proven that to me, and and, uh, and and I think we should take some solace in that. Sierra Chicago, come on. <laughs> Pop over here, tell us your name and your question. Hi, uh, my name is May, and it's really surreal being able to ask you a question. But um, <laughs> in uh, elementary school, my entire understanding of vampires came from a specific movie we were in. And Twilight is what you're referring to, <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Actually, that's part of the question. Yeah. Um, oh, that's <laughs> my brother hated the movie. I used to put it on all the time. I was like five. That's probably not a good look for my parents, but you know, whatever. And so, like, that's my understanding of vampires. So, in a <laughs> fandom, like, sometimes they do, like, versus mashups. Who do you think would win? Do you think 80s vampires would win? Or oh. do you think early 2000s oh. glitter, sparkly vampires would win? It's <laughs> kind of leading you here a little bit. Uh. Well, <laughs> in, huh. <laughs> You know what, I'm just gonna say, I think the wardrobe for the 80s vampires was probably cooler. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I have to say, as vampires have evolved over the, the 30 some odd years or 40 years that, that I've had experience with mine, um, the newer vampires seem to have more superpowers. Mm. So that's a little alarming. So. So my group of vampires would have had to charm our way into a lot more situations <laughs> than I think the newer ones. But it, it is something that's kind of, uh, and it's certainly not something, I, I was 18 when I made the film. Um, and I don't think I thought, oh, this is gonna be so great, I get to do a vampire movie. I was, I was much more myopic about it, of the character and kind of how, how can I get this done and how can I accomplish that. And, you know, it's not till much later that you're just really grateful that you're part of something that that is iconic within the genre. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, as much as I admire Bela Lugosi and the kind of portrayals that he did back in the 30s or 40s, uh, I'm 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 honored to be part of a lineage, um, and it's just such a great kind of fantasy and idea. So uh, I was thrilled to be a part of it. Uh, and in hindsight, as I get older, I, I start to kind of 
acknowledge what maybe I took for granted when I was younger <laughs> and how thrilled I was to be a part of a film like that. But I don't know who can kick whose ass. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, tell us your name and your question. Hi, my name is Christine, and I got to say to a fellow Gen Xer, it's um, a little swoon worthy getting to talk to you today. <laughs> um, but my question, as a mom of fellow performers, um, I wanted to ask you about your musical career and who your influences were. Oh my gosh, um, the the music stuff I've, I've played since I was I played guitar since I was ten, violin since I was four, um, but the. the the idea that it could be called a career, uh, which it can now, uh, was completely by accident. I was certainly aware of the fact that uh, actors doing music, uh, there was, it just was not a good thing. It was just not a, a good look. People wanted their actors to be actors and their singers to be singers. Uh, and I can go all the way back and, and say that I don't think Frank Sinatra was ever given his fair credit as an actor because he was considered to be a singer. Um, having said that, uh, I was working with a guy named Jude Cole, uh, who is one of the most extraordinary singer-songwriters, uh, I think, in the world, uh, certainly in the English language. Um, and I had written some songs, uh, and after 15, 20 years, a couple of these songs he didn't make fun of. And, <laughs> and so, uh, he said, I'd really like to record a couple of those, and so we did, and, but I said I didn't want to make an album because, again, I was really aware of this uh, stigma, and uh, we ended up doing four or five songs, and I loved the way he made them sound, uh, and, he, you know, and, and he would help me with the writing, so I would have the bridges and the choruses, uh, sorry, the choruses and the verses finished. Uh, but I didn't have a bridge, and, and we would work on that together. And, and he, I learned so much from him at that point. And then finally, there's the kind of come to Jesus moment where you've got seven or eight songs, and you go, you know what? I, I, I either really like these, and I'm going to go for it. And if people make fun of me, then so be it. <laughs> or I'm not. I'm not. I, I'll, these are just mine, and I'll keep them to myself. And I, I felt the other way. I wanted to play them live, and I was really proud of the songs. And then. You know, I'm a bit cynical, and so in that context, uh, I was waiting to put out the record and then just simply be eviscerated like that was what's going to happen. <laughs> and, and I wasn't. And in fact, there was a guy who wrote a review, a really respected reviewer out of Nashville, and I think the first line of his review was, you have no idea how much I wanted to hate this. <laughs> And then is kind enough to say, but I didn't. Yeah. And then went on. And then, and the same with, with doing the shows, right? It took me about a year to realize that people weren't just coming to throw stuff at you, right? That they, and it dawned on me that they, the people that were coming to my shows wanted me to do well. And that was a huge education for me. Um, just kind of in the relationship between me and you all, you know, and um, and so it was an important step forward to kind of just understanding uh, the depth of support that I've had my whole life that I maybe wasn't aware of, and the music helped me kind of figure that out a lot. But it was all in kind of baby steps. It was there was no waking up in the morning and today I'm gonna be a singer. You know? <laughs> it was it was incremental. That's awesome. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Y'all, uh, we, we are basically out of time. Uh, if you um, have a question, don't forget to have that uh, intimate, um, personal moment uh, at Keeper's Table. He'll be signing uh, all day. Let's do uh, one final question here. Tell us your name and your question. Hi, I'm Tabitha. Um, lovely to meet you. Um, so I actually kind of had a related question to the girl who's asking about the 90s movies. I had a specific <laughs> 90s movie um, done in 96 with Reese Witherspoon when she was young. And then <laughs> And I guess I was curious if you had like a, a memory to share about that, since you already talked about kind of like how to get into the character, um, but just like a memory around that film or just like the experience of that film. Well, it's, so, the, the, the film that you're referencing, <laughs> my oldest daughter was at the University of San Francisco first year and it came out, uh, it, it was made for cable, but it came out in the theaters 
Just a man, very limited response uh, so that it could be considered a feature film. Um, the film was so quirky that it got a cult status kind of almost immediately and all of a sudden at the University of San Francisco where my daughter was going kind of was like a Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I can honestly say that that was the first time my oldest daughter thought I might have been cool for a <laughs> <laughs> So I have great affection for this really dirty, nasty film. Yeah. And, um, and the great memory that I have from it uh, is Reese Witherspoon, and, and no joke, uh, and, and she's a friend of mine. Um, but she looked so much like her, like the legally blonde character <laughs> down the line. That's who I was working with on that movie. Oh, wow. She had a little dog that she carried everywhere. She was very well put together and she was very kind of proper and precise. And so then when she would come up with lines like, how's your shit bag, Bob? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe she just said that. <laughs> and, and she had a ton more that I just, I saw a 10 year old over there and I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> and, and she had a lot of lines that were worse than that. And her performance is just, mind-blowingly good yeah and uh, and and so I was just very proud to have because it, it really helped kind of move her forward as an actor and uh, I was very proud to have gotten to work with her and, and not that it was my place to be but I was very proud of the work that she did amazing thank you so good. much yeah, thank you uh, I think I, I think I speak for everyone in the room when I say uh, we're all here because all of your performances are mind-blowingly good and we love them all we thank you for being here. Phoenix for Chicago. Give it up for Mr. Keeper. I want to give a special shout out to the Gold Ranger members, Anime King Nick, Chaos Draco, the Arctic Operator, Dig Wyron, Tim Rage, Roderick Hare, Miguel Ortiz, Let's Talk Sports, Papleon Oger, Roderick Ham, Jason Morazes, Willie Maloney, Louis Cairns, Salima Ramirez, Danny Nascimento, Skurd, Stephen Heffelman, and Thomas Franco. Thank you guys so much for your support. And if you want a video shout out like this one, sign up to be a Gold Ranger member today. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, you know what to do. Hit that like, hit that subscribe button, and hit that notification bell. You can also become a member. Please join the fan club support team right now. We have a Blue Ranger power up and a Gold Ranger power up. This is an awesome way to talk with the fans. Join a fan club official chat group. You can also be featured in our videos. At the end of the videos, I will shout you out. That's if you get the Gold Ranger Power Up membership. Go check it out. Go support the fan club. We love you guys, and thanks for watching. Peace. Hi. Hi. We're Bulk and Let's Skull. Go. We, we have been requested, requested by, by the, the fan club, club to say something funny. <laughs>